I had a discussion video fall through at the last minute, so I'm doing a Q&A. And because of the short notice with my Patreon supporters meant fewer questions than usual, I also thought I'd take the opportunity to respond to a few of the comments that were left on the trigonometry interview I did this week. So let's jump straight in. Hi Malin, how likely do you think it is that biological or chemical weapons will be used in Ukraine? And given the claims of Victoria Newland, that any such occurrence will definitely be the fault of Putin. How do you think any false flags would play out? Meaning, if America committed such an attack and blamed it on Putin, would they get away with it, do you think? On track record, it is highly probable that biological or chemical weapons will be used in Ukraine. But it comes down to strategy. Having failed to get a rapid and largely unopposed takeover, they are now apparently following the strategy of inflicting maximum harm on civilian populations in the expectation that eventually it will force the government to surrender sufficiently that Moscow will consider their objectives to have been met. Now, chemical weapons were used in Syria, as we know, and although Obama said that it would cross a red line if they had been, nothing happened as a result. If Putin is perceiving the situation clearly, he will know that the West is too scared of nuclear war to directly intervene, almost whatever he does. If he thinks that the use of such weapons are more likely to achieve his goals, it will therefore be very tempting for him. The constraining factor will be if his hope is that once the war is over, he can relatively quickly be rehabilitated back into the world community because the level of sanctions has caught him a little off guard. It's a lot higher than he'd expected the West to be able to muster. And, you know, he doesn't aspire to Russia being the next North Korea. So if he calculates that he could win without the psychological impact of chemical weapons, and he thinks there's a chance of faster Russian economic recovery without them, that will be a factor. But he will not countenance, from what I can see, losing. And ironically, the worrying thing is that Ukraine is fighting back so much more effectively than anyone expected, it may make it more likely that he resorts to those methods if he feels that's the only way to avoid outright defeat. That's all in line with his incentives, given where he is, and his clear stated objectives and what they've done in the past. I do not see the rationale for why America would commit such an attack as a false flag attack, as you say, to blame on Putin. It's not their history, and it's not in line with their incentives in this situation. America has made plenty of mistakes in its history, don't get me wrong, but I have seen nothing to support the idea that they think it morally acceptable to use chemical or biological weapons in the modern age. It's true that one should never count on morality as a factor in international politics, but it would be the most grievous blow to American credibility and prestige worldwide if it were found to have used such weapons. It would be an extraordinary thing for them to do. And utterly stupid if, in that modern era, they thought they could get away with it. You only have to look at the Bellingcat investigations of chemical weapon use in Syria to understand no state should presume it could get away with such an operation now. But even if they felt they could, it's not remotely in their interest to do so. The world is already united against Russia to the degree that it's ever going to be. I mean, those states that are standing aside, they're not going to change their mind based on what weapons Russia uses, or at least not short of nuclear weapons anyway. So what would America achieve by implementing a false flag attack to blame on Russia? Now, I know that there will be some creative types who can come up with some sort of wild rationale as an answer to that question, but it doesn't fit any analysis of their military or political strategy to date. What do you think about the idea the PRC, the People's Republic of China, is looking at the Ukraine situation to further plan the assimilation of Taiwan? While it's completely certain they're evaluating the current events with a view to what it means to them, the question is which way recent events are pushing them in their thinking. And I wouldn't jump too quickly to conclusions on that. Remember, the Chinese Communist Party, and Putin as well for that matter, see the world through a very different frame to the West. We shouldn't expect that they will see the lessons of Ukraine in the same way that we would see them. If they were perceiving events anything like the way that I am, 
which probably not, but if they were, I would expect the prospect of early action has moved further away, not closer. Now, it might have moved closer if Putin's actions had completely shown the West to be so weak and divided that we just fell apart in the face of his action. That might well have prompted them to think that they would... At the very least, they could go to Taiwan and say, look, America's not going to be able to support you. We have overwhelming force. Let's be pragmatic about the inevitability of where all this goes. But that's not what happened. The West showed that even though it has indeed been obsessing about nonsense for the last decade, it still has enough muscle memory about defending freedoms to be a nuisance, at least. So my lessons for China would be this. One, a sizable population can be incredibly hard to absorb into your country if they don't want to be. Two, Russia has had to work hard to address the sense amongst its own people that Ukrainians are their close cousins. The shock of brutality against people like us, that's hard even for a dictator to sustain. And China would have that as well. It's hard to argue that you are all one people and then bomb a civilian population without mercy. Three, militaries that look good on paper don't always deliver in reality. China has a more modern and well-equipped and funded military than Russia, but it still hasn't fought any major wars with them. Using your military to intimidate and project power, that's one thing, and you can get some of your foreign policy objectives through in that sort of way, but you might want to be careful about assuming that delivers you automatic success in actual warfare. Oh, and four, China will be thinking that its approach to building a sphere of influence through its Belt and Road Initiative is very much superior to Russia's old empire-building vision of invading and holding territory. Now, China doesn't apply that to Taiwan because it doesn't accept Taiwan is a separate country, but just in principle, spheres of influence and all. If I were China, I would be thinking that the West is likely to continue to decline over time. The odds are great that the current coalition that's jumped up in the face of Russia won't endure. China can continue to build up its forces. It doesn't need to be in that much of a hurry. Taiwan by 2050 is just fine. And if in the meantime, they can work on increasing the financial links between them and Taiwan, get better at influencing the perception of the population of Taiwan and the tone of the politics there, then all to the good. Because, you know, if they can absorb Taiwan without a shot being fired in 20 years time, that will be seen as a massively preferable outcome to any sort of shooting war now. Now, I gave you my caveat. China is now a one-man dictatorship. There is no guarantee that man doesn't have a skewed view of his options or doesn't make a colossal miscalculation. In a related question, any insight as to what we might see from the world's other dictators and autocrats in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Not all dictators are created equal. It's really only Russia and China that see their flavour of autocracy as being a distinguishing feature of the coming new world order. One key lesson both will be taking from this is the need for them to develop resilient alternative systems to be stronger in the face of future conflict and economic sanctions and that sort of thing. The interesting thing in this situation is how much the BRICS coalition of emerging economic power is held together. That's BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. People don't entirely get how much Putin cultivated the BRICS group to see itself as a counterweight to the arrogant, unpopular dominance of America as he saw it. And it's notable that Brazil, India, South Africa and of course China have been unwilling to pile into the anti-Putin outrage. What you see in that is the emergence of a coalition of, you could say, historical resentment that is standing up to a stress test as a potential building block for new world powers. So when it comes to alternative financial systems, alternative trading coalitions, mutual spheres of interest, I think we're going to see much more energy going into dividing the world into those two powerful blocks of association. 
All right, new topic coming up. Hi, Alan. Do you think that all the backlash against Leah Thomas is the beginning of the tide turning in the debate around men in women's sports? So this is Leah Thomas, the swimmer who competed in the men's competitions and then transitioned to become a trans woman and inevitably attracts attention because physically the disparity is so visibly striking and that is also, of course, reflected in the performance. You can't get much more of a powerful indication of how the other women competitors feel about it than from this photo, where Thomas stands alone on the number one podium and the women have brought on the number four placed woman and are posing for a separate photo together. And also a write-up on that race, which I didn't see myself, that recorded that when Thomas reached the end, the crowd was silent, but then it erupted into wild cheers when the number two Emma Wayant came in. And look, I did a video deep dive on transgender in professional sports that looks at all the detail of which sports could aspire to fairness in this situation, which, because of biological realities, really couldn't. But this was inevitable, and it is going to keep happening until it's finally addressed. The question will be whether we have to wait until all women's world records are held by men, or if we're capable of having a sensible discussion before that happens. But by and large, ordinary, non-ideological people don't like the obvious impression of unfairness. If certain institutions cave into the demands of activists, then it's inevitable that more and more of these are going to start to pile up as the visual impression of unfairness keeps happening. Biological men smashing records in women's sport. Sooner or later, the repeated obvious unfairness will prompt enough of a backlash that changes will be made. I mean, it has to. You can call all those people bigots if you want, but those other competitors were clear about who won the women's race. The crowd was clear about who won the women's race. Either bigotry has become more contagious than Omicron, or you're missing something rather important about the nature of sport and competition. Now, people then say, but what about the transgender athletes' right to compete? And of course they have a right to compete at some level in sport. But the vast majority of athletes don't have the right to win competitions because they're not good enough. Just one of those things. Life's a bitch sometimes. As a man, Will Thomas was ranked 554th. It's no sense is a denial of Leah Thomas's human rights if the podium in women's races is reserved for biological women. Look, I get it. I think it's shocking that I'm not allowed to play Wimbledon this year. But there it is. The British royals have been getting some pushback in the Caribbean. Is it time the former empire countries kicked them out as their head of state? Entirely up to them, obviously. Prince William and Kate are there on a charm offensive. And yes, there have been some protests, although there's been lots of enthusiasm as well. None of us should jump to conclusions about where the public mood really is. But I've never personally really understood why any country outside Britain would have the Queen as their head of state. I find it a bit of a weird anachronism. And, you know, let's be clear, it endures probably because the current Queen has been the most competent head of state of just about anywhere over the last 50 years. I mean, if we're talking about sensible governance of a country, I would tend to consider myself a Republican, certainly not a royalist. But I'm not fussed right now, like much of the country, because she is pitch perfect at what she does. Now, maybe that will endure. Charles is not so capable, but he's a known quantity and he probably won't be disastrous. William and Kate seem as though they may be the royals that manage to be modern and traditional in equal measure and pull off a really difficult balancing act, which, you know, good for them. But if they turned out to be disastrous, well, it's all the same, so long as you have a hereditary system. Would I be happy to see King Harry on the throne? A whole bunch of no. And that probably goes for most of the folks in the Caribbean, I'm guessing. Could be wrong. The media has many problems, and its job is so vital. How do we save it from problems like ideological capture and funding problems that make it seem less credible? I am relying more and more on people like you who have the time to look through these issues rather than trust that they can do it themselves. I trust you more than I trust them. Is that my own bias or have they fallen that far? 
when it comes to the politics, there's always been an ideological element in the media. It's just that in the UK and many other countries, you get choice. And the arguments of both sides get to be heard by those that choose to hear them. And we still have that. People on the right read The Telegraph. People on the left read The Guardian. That still works. The challenge we're increasingly faced with, though, is that the big global issues that seem to demand some technocratic response, the pandemic, obviously, and climate change, obviously, in both of those cases, when you get much more pressure on what is said because of a perception that the science leads you intuitively and correctly to one set of policy responses. And if you even question those policy responses, then you are denying the science, putting yourself out of the bounds of legitimate discourse, spreading dangerous ideas. That tendency doesn't divide neatly between left and right, and that's where you run the risk of what you describe as ideological capture, because you stop getting choice, and you start finding the core information that's meant to inform you is getting filtered ideologically before it reaches you. I do think one can overstate it. There are still challenges to be made to dodgy data, even if they may be slower to reach the mainstream. So, for instance, the lab leak hypothesis dismissed as conspiracy when I first covered it on this channel, but it has eventually emerged into the mainstream as something that is at least worthy of debate. It just took longer to get there. So I'm not as pessimistic on all of this as you might be. Although the growing instances of the young woke employees forcing spineless companies to censor normal discourse, that is certainly a factor and something to be pushed back against. As for whether you should trust me more than them, well, look, thank you for your trust. I will try not to betray that trust in doing anything other than trying to represent the truth as I found it. I have no doubt I will make mistakes and get things wrong, which point, yes, I'll correct myself and all of that. But there are lots of people writing and contributing to the mainstream who aim to do likewise. My advice is not to pigeonhole people, but take them as you find them. OK, next. Hello, Mr Baker. I often hear you talk about the declining Western Empire or other descriptions of the Western world to the same effect. But what is really declining? What is it we stand to lose? Does this decline imply that our values of democracy and free thought and speech is also in decline or under threat? For the detail, I would refer you to the video where I covered Ray Dalio's arguments, which I titled Why the West is Finished, or something similar. In short, it relates to the question of which country is the dominant power over a set period of time. In the past, it was the British Empire. Now it's the United States. On current trends, it will be a conflict about whether China successfully continues its emergence to take that spot. Now, there was no real values gap between the UK and the US. So you could see it perhaps as being an extended reign of democracies and Western values for several hundred years. But if you're no longer dominant, well, your currency will no longer be the global reserve currency, meaning you can't borrow and spend as much as you could. You will be materially less well off, although that doesn't mean you have to be impoverished by any means. You won't be so influential on the world stage. So those that are who may be authoritarians, of course, they will win many more things at your expense. Will democracy and free speech also be in decline? Well, it already is. Over the last 10 years, the number of democracies in the world has declined. And right now we see institutions like universities, cultural bodies and more tempering their speech in the face of Chinese influence. The West has, in the past, applied sanctions against countries that engage in practices that we dislike. You can expect the same logic to be used against us for the privilege of exercising that free speech if it offends the powerful. Exactly how does it work out? We don't really know. But what I've just described is an extension of existing trends that we can already observe. So yes, I don't overly care if my country is number one or number two in the world although I'd rather it wasn't impoverished, but I do care if the global norm will be that what I do here, speak freely about what I see and what I think about what I see, if that were to become forbidden or severely constrained in some way. I'm not saying it's a foregone conclusion, but that is what is worth standing up for. 
Now, there were some fun comments on the trigonometry interview that I did that I thought I'd throw in here as well. Mostly, by the way, worth saying, I was taken aback by how positive many of the comments were, and particularly from regular viewers here expressing their support for me there. Thanks to all of you who did that. I had no idea how that episode would be received, so I really appreciated all those comments. But of course, it's the snarky comments that I want to respond to. Some of which actually ask perfectly good questions, even if by accident. Why are we listening to a YouTuber and commentator about climate change rather than a scientist? I'm willing to bet the person who made that comment hadn't thought through the implications of what he was implying. But here's my answer. If you want a video about the detail of the science, then you should absolutely get a scientist in that relative field to give it to you. However, this is one of those areas where the science bleeds into public policy. And in a big way, that is an area where all citizens have a voice, at least in those pesky democracies. Such discussion should be informed by the science, of course, hopefully, but everyone still has to debate what should be done about it, what are the trade-offs you are willing to make against other political societal objectives. If your position is that non-scientists aren't ever allowed to talk about climate change and, you know, presumably pandemics, then you're arguing for out-and-out out technocracy. Hand over the levers of government to the scientists for them to pursue the policy goals prioritised by the science and everyone else, shut up, because you're not qualified. I try to get the best understanding of what the science says, what are the implications. I will always defer to technical expertise on those questions. But the so what question is the most interesting and important one. And we all get a voice in it. Baker makes some important points. But the first thing he explains is all the mistakes of judgment he has made over 30 years. Why should we value what he says today? He may decide, but it was all a mistake in a few months time. I think that comment slightly overstates the all the mistakes of judgment line, but I am open about having changed my mind on certain key issues, so the principle of the question holds. But again, I'm not sure the commentator has fully absorbed the implications of his own question. The logic of that argument is that you should discount the wisdom of age, because that implies that people learned lessons over the course of their life and presumably therefore changed their minds. Who do you trust more? Someone who changes their mind when presented with new information or experience, or someone who determinedly insists they were right all along, even in the face of new information or experience? Why celebrate the wisdom of age if you really want to celebrate those who haven't changed their mind since they were 18 and thought they knew it all anyway? Of course, the flip side why we should value what he says today, well, I don't ask you to take what I say on trust. When I do deep dive videos, I provide references for the research with links so that you can check them out for yourself. Good practice to have regardless whose words you're listening to. I would stop worrying about who's making an argument versus evaluating whether the argument is supported by logic and or evidence. Those things are independent of who made the argument. So he's worried that there is a finite amount of farmland, yet the windmill and solar panel farms pushed by greens already use up large tracts of land that could be better used for farming. If we were to become much less dependent on fossil fuels, it would require considerable more farmland unless we go with nuclear power. Indeed, different energy sources have different features and there are trade-offs to be made. The lack of energy density in renewables is a real limiting factor that the hardcore environmentalists do seem reasonably blind to in most discussions. And right now, the only zero carbon energy source that has a similar energy density to fossil fuels is indeed nuclear. I mean, that also has some drawbacks. So the sort of mix that was described by the UK Committee on Climate Change of a balanced grid with significant renewables. The UK has a luxury of lots of offshore wind, of course, but also then with a core of always on power from nuclear, as well as much more storage capacity and then hydrogen for uses for its particular properties and a degree of natural gas with carbon capture for topping up. 
One can argue about the details, but the principle is that of a pragmatic mix, weighing the pros of one energy source against the cons of another. As far as I can see, for people who insist it has to be all of one thing or all of the other thing, they are the ones whose approach has been prone to ideological drift. And you can kind of see that in the question. He's jumped to an assumption that I promote renewables because I've said climate change is a thing and I answered a question about what energy sources were currently cheaper. I don't campaign for energy sources. There's surely half a dozen different mixes of sources that any country could opt for depending on its geography, its circumstances, its preferences. And I don't care what they choose so long as they properly thought through the consequences which, for example, Germany demonstrably failed to do in recent decades, which is now coming back to bite them. Final question. A bit long, but I couldn't shorten it. While there is truth in what Malin says, at the same time we cannot ever let this realism balance stance turn into a stone around the neck of what needs to be done to prevent climate change. It is equally important to encourage people to have humility, most people do not have the tools to make accurate, intuitive judgments about dynamical systems like climate, even given the scientific data. Life experience is not enough. Even as somebody who is usually a libertarian, I have to say it terrifies me that climate change is seen as something that is basically a democratic issue, when it is an issue that the wisdom of crowds most certainly does not apply to. So this basically is the case for technocracy. Let the experts decide. I think it's mistaken for two reasons. One, experts in one thing should only be in charge of processes that are solely to do with that thing. And government should never be confused for that. Climate scientists have said that increasing CO2 is driving climate change. In order for that to stop, human-caused emissions need to become net zero in carbon and that we will avoid the more consequences the faster we can do that. That's all we need from them, to be honest. Governments have to try to work out the way to achieve that at the same time as preserving our prosperity, our way of life, not to create unintended consequences for other systems, including biodiversity, by the way, not all environmental issues line up behind one set of solutions. There are trade-offs again. And not only all of that, they have to work out how to take the support of the population with them. Because if you don't do that, you won't get licensed to do any of it. That's what the would-be technocrats don't understand. They say this is too urgent, action needs to be taken now, we don't have time to waste trying to persuade and take people with us. But unless you take people with you, you won't get permission to do the things that you think are so urgent. And if you try to push them through in whatever way comes to hand, whatever way you think you can, then you will get the rise of the newer and more potent populists fueled by the outrage amongst all those people whose value you are dismissing. And I might even vote for them because dictatorship of the technocrats is probably going to be a far worse option than you think it is. But of course, the valid part of the argument is also there. If we have a realistic view about the fact this is a slow burn long term issue that needs early action, we run the risk that all the politicians think, well, it's long term, they can keep kicking the can down the road. And that is a fair comment. Although I do think that we've now reached a point where governments know that it can't be put off in the way that they were doing in the past. But the answer to that problem cannot be to embrace authoritarianism allied to technocracy. We would lose a heck of a lot more than we would gain by doing that. And it wouldn't work anyway. All right, that's what I think. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for all the great questions and comments. See you on Friday for the news roundup of the week. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself.